So I'm very happy to uh, begin the annual Alperin event. And this event, and we are joined here by Lionel and Esther, uh, held today in the honor of the Alperin de Genève in Switzerland, who are amongst the pillars of Ben Gurion University. The late Michel Alperin and his father Vladimir both served as chairperson of the Swiss Friends of BGU, generating much international support. And with that, we're thankful. And Lionel uh, has followed those footsteps, raising awareness of BGU and expanding our Swiss circle of support. Over the past quarter of a century, the Alperin Families Foundation has underwritten leadership training for many hundreds of students and more recently established the much needed student center for the international students of uh, our stable care campus. So thank you very much and we're honored to have you here. And this year event is dedicated to the theme women in academic leadership and also uh, in other social arenas. And uh, just let me first introduce myself. I'm, uh, my name is Professor Haleli Pinson. I'm a professor at the Department of Education at BGU. And since March 2021, I'm also the presidential advisor for gender equity. So obviously this is very dear and near subject to my heart. Um, and just an, uh, kind of reflecting on my uh, role in the past year or so, I can say quite confidently that BGU has put a lot of effort in the past years in promoting gender equity. And uh, it only seems, seems fit that when we have such extraordinary women at BGU, but also recipients of our honorary doctorate that will dedicate a session uh, to uh, women leadership. And I also learned yesterday evening from Lionel that his father in his company was very uh, um, aware of the need to promote women and, and make, making them partners and actually giving them opportunities. So again, it's a nice uh, kind of uh, fit, I think, for this event. So I'm delighted and I'm truly honored to invite four outstanding uh, women to join me in a conversation about women leadership. And uh, women that each one of them are uh, a glass and sometimes concrete ceiling breaker, uh, as I define them, on their own right. So uh, first I'd like, uh, I probably will repeat some of the wonderful thing we heard about our two on Dr. Honorary recipients uh, yesterday, but I think it's worth mentioning again. So uh, I'm first joined by Professor Leeds Richardson, who um, is the first female vice chancellor of the University of Oxford, only 900 years uh, uh, of uh, male vice chancellors, and uh, a former vice chancellor of the University of St. Andrews, where she also was the first uh, woman to take up the role, an institution uh, of 600 years. And these are just the last two roles in a very long resume of academic leadership uh, in academia. And Professor Richardson is a native Irish uh, who grew up in a rural area to a family of seven. She's also first in her family to enter academia. And this is another, I think, remarkable uh, thing to point out. She's a political scientist and a renowned international scholar of terrorism and counterterrorism. For her scholarly work in the field, she received the Sumner Prize for work towards the prevention of terrorism and the establishment of universal peace. And not least impressive, the honor doctorate she received yesterday from BGU is her, I think, ninth uh, in line. So uh, quite impressive, I might say. Uh, and we joined by uh, Rabbi uh, Denise Eger, the international Jewish leader and social uh, justice activist, uh, not the least. And she's the founder of Call Ami Congregation in West Hollywood and was the first woman rabbi with her own puppet in LA, as I learned. Um, she's the past president of the Central Conference of America Rabbis and was the first openly gay or lesbian person in that position. She's also the first woman ever to be elected as president of the Southern California Board of Rabbis. And just to mention a few other uh, kind of uh, remarkable achievements, she was named one as one of the 50 most influential Jews uh, in Ford 
and one of the 50 most influential women rabbis, and Huffington Post named her as the number one LGBTQ clergy person in the US. Um, and by the way, beside her um, uh, as, uh, work as a, a, a Jewish leader, um, she also wrote quite extensively uh, and contributed to public and scholarly discussion on gender and religious leadership. And I just got uh, one of the edited book and another book, which I'm looking forward to read. And, um, and we, ha we are joined here by two of our own professors uh, at BGU, Professor Sarah Abukaf, who is the head of the Department of Multidisciplinary Studies and a faculty member of the Conflict Management Resolution Program at BGU. She's an expert at cross-cultural psychology and her work focuses on different uh, uh, sources of stress coping and coping strategies uh, of, of, of among women, youth, elderly from different cultural background with a specific focus on the Bedouin Arabs community in Israel. Um, she's the only, f she's one of two, I think, only female Bedouin professors in Israel and the first generation to higher education. She lives in an unrecognized village of Umbatin and uh, just a few other mentioning, she was uh, selected in uh, 2013 by The Marker, one of the major business uh, um, uh, financial magazine in Israel, uh, to the list of the 40 most promising young people. I think she lived to the, that promise. And she was named by, in 2018, by Forbes Israel magazine as one of the, uh, one of the most uh, 50 influential women in Israel. And um, finally, we have Professor Racha Shapira, who is a professor at the Department of Software Information System and Engineering and the Carl Winston Chair of Information Systems. She was the head of the department and the vice dean for research and the Faculty of Engineering. And currently, she serves as the head of the academic community, uh, a committee of the National Council for the Promotion of Women in STEM, um, formed by the Ministry of Technology and Science. She is a research, her research focuses on artificial intelligence and more specifically machine learning. And she was born in Tel Aviv to an Orthodox family. She is also a first generation, by the way, all these remarkable women are first generation uh, to higher education. And she's a mother of five sons, and you won't believe it, but also a grandmother. <laughs> Doesn't look like it. So um, what we agreed between us, that I'll pose uh, several questions uh, that all of you can uh, tip in and, and kind of uh, uh, give your input. And then I, if we'll have the time, I have some tailored individual questions for each one of you. So um, as I said in the beginning, I. Uh, I call, I call all of you uh, ceiling breakers, uh, glass ceiling breakers, and, um, and sometimes, as I said, concrete ceiling. Um, and the first question I would like to pose is, um, how did you become an, an academic or social or religious leader? Uh, what drove you? What, it, what sort of thing in your biography led you to where you are? We'll start with you. Uh, thank you and good morning everyone. Um, well, as, as was just mentioned, I grew up as one of seven children, so I have three brothers. And I have to say I, that much as I love my three brothers, there's nothing like having three brothers to explode the myth of male superiority. So, uh, um, so it never occurred to me that there was anything that they could do that I couldn't do better. Um, <laughs> Um, and so academia was more by accident than design. It was simply a case of, of um, seeing an opportunity and, and going for it. My, my first big break was um, seeing an ad in the Irish Times for a, um, a, a rotary scholarship. And this scholarship allowed you to study anything in the world you liked, any place in the world you liked. And I was very conscious of being a, a country girl up in Dublin at university, completely out of my depth socially. And I thought this would be very good experience to apply for this scholarship. Um, so I applied for it and nobody was more surprised than I was when I, I won. Um, 
And um, to give you an idea, I, you, you had to list five universities around the world that you'd like to study in, no more than three in one country. And so I listed uh, the Sorbonne, the University of Geneva, and America sounded exotic. So we had this ancient uh, encyclopedia at home, and I looked up the American universities I'd heard of. So I looked up Harvard, and it said men only. I looked up Yale, and it said men only. I hadn't realized that the universities had long since changed, but it was a very old encyclopedia. <laughs> so. There was a photograph of this um, uh, California and the beaches in California, and I thought, oh, wonderful. The sun, beaches, what could be wrong with that? So I put down the University of California, and that's where I ended up for a year, and that just opened my mind to all, the, all sorts of possibilities. So um, after that, I just would see an opportunity and hope for the best and take a shot at it, and uh, so there was nothing very carefully planned about my career. Um, well, I think, I think I have to really thank my parents. Uh, neither went to college. My mother would whisper in my ear, don't be any man's schmata, for those of you that knows Yiddish. Um, and always tried to, I think my mother really wanted to go to college, but didn't have that opportunity having graduated high school during the depression. And so, um, so for them, that was really always important that I uh, go to school and um, I did well in school. And um, for me, I think the second piece of that was that I saw my parents engaged in Jewish life and in synagogue life. And the synagogue really became my second home. My own rabbis mentored me and taught me. And um, I was really influenced by our rabbi. I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, after we moved from Pennsylvania. And um, my rabbi, Rabbi James Wax, was the rabbi when Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. He was the head of the Interfaith Association in Memphis, Tennessee, and um, had invited Dr. King to Memphis to help settle a strike of the sanitation workers with the city of Memphis. So he felt an enormous responsibility for what had happened to him. And the day that uh, Dr. King was assassinated led all of the clergy in town on a march through the streets of Memphis to confront the mayor. Um, this, this influenced me, his work influenced me very much about what uh, the power of living your Jewish values can do to help change the world and to make change and to have impact. And so um, I really was um, grateful to have learned at the feet of great rabbis and to have learned at the feet of my own family for whom tzedakah was uh, a charity, giving charity and tzedakah and doing acts of righteousness was a really important part of their everyday life. Um, and so I really attribute much of, of my, my grounding to, to them. In my case, uh, what has led me to the place that I am in today, uh, it was the hard decisions and the challenging decisions I made uh, at the different stages in my life and in my career. For example, as a young mother uh, at age of 19, surrounded by uh, many, young lady, many, many young women, uh, who are staying at home and establishing their own families, I decided to go and to pursue higher education. Uh, I, I was uh, uh, specifically interested in uh, behavioral sciences and psychology, which is a very demanding measure. Another example is related to my postdoc. Uh, when I finished my PhD studies, I am interested in a postdoc experience uh, abroad. And then I heard uh, many voices around me saying that I, it's so difficult to do that with my big family and many uh, doubts about the, uh, my ability to recruit the required resources to do that. At the end of that year, I uh, won a prestigious postdoc fellowship. I was accepted by Professor Arthur Kleinman to work with him in the anthropology department at Harvard University. 
and moved with my husband our six, and our six children to the state. So I am really convinced that those, these hard decisions and the challenging decisions that I made formed my unique career path and booted me in a leading position. Hi, uh, uh, good morning. So, um, in my case, I grew up in Tel Aviv in a, what we call Haredi family, ultra-Orthodox, but very open-minded. Uh, my mother is a Holocaust survivor, and it was very important to her that we study, that we um, uh, excel, and that we really uh, make a difference to the world. Uh, having said that, I started my career as most of my um, girls, um, girlfriends in the high school that I, I joined as um, in a college, in a religious college for uh, education. But like very soon I, I said that it's not my passion. I don't have the skills to, um, to be a teacher for kids. So uh, with my parents, we decided that yes, I'll take the, um, I'll go to university. And then I just, I didn't know what it means and what is computer science, but I just heard that computers is like a good profession. So I said, okay, let's take it. And I, I actually, my uh, BSc was in computer science and the music because I like to play piano. But then, you know, um, as was said already here, I didn't plan my career. I just, um, you know, took the opportunities. So, like, after I graduated my uh, BSc, I went to the, um, you know, to industry. I was a few years in the industry as a programmer and a team lead and so on. But then I decided that I, why not taking, like, the master's degree? And then after that, I decided that I liked the academia and, you know, things happened and uh, through my, you know, uh, milestones in my path of my career, I just um, took the opportunity and remember what my mother always told me, just take, be brave, try to make an impact and I just try to do it. So I'm a sociologist, so I can't not think about the common themes. <laughs> around this conversation. So, I mean, one thing that comes to mind is the role of family, whether it's fighting with your brothers or, uh, or having supportive parents or, uh, or, or partner, but also uh, the, the ability to seize the opportunity. And I think that's something that um, often, it, it, well, it stands out, it makes you unique and probably put you in the leadership position, the ability to seize opportunities and you know, make the best of them. So another question I, I want to um, uh, pose to all of you is that, I mean, many of you or all of you find yourself in a position of being a first or one of few uh, women in your position. And I want to ask you about the burden of being uh, or the responsibility of being the first, the one of few, uh, of being sort of a role model. So... Um, well, yes, it, it, I think it would be disingenuous to deny the si symbolic significance of being the first woman in a role, and I, I, I'm acutely conscious of that. I, I think you don't have the option of not being a success if you're, not, if you're the first woman, and it's always my determination that um, I'll not be the last woman, and uh, I, one of the barometers I hold uh, to evaluate my own success is whether I be succeeded by a woman. And I'm delighted to say that the process of selecting my successor as um, uh, head uh, vice chancellor of Oxford led to an all female shortlist. So, um, <laughs> which, um, given it took 900 years to, to choose one. Um, it, but I do think if, if a woman is, is not a success in a role, there is absolutely no chance that they will be succeeded by a woman. And we've seen in so many universities where a woman is appointed and the university feels, right, we've done that, we've proven our liberal credentials, we can go back to normal behavior, business as usual now. Um, uh, whereas, it, you know, if a man is a success or a failure, it has no bearing on the gender of, of uh, his successor, whereas I think it really matters for a woman. 
And I do remember as a young faculty member, and the reason I think there aren't more women at the top of all professions is because of the, the difficulty of uh, combining a career and a family. So my um, hat <laughs> comes off to you managing to move with, with six children. But I do remember as a, a young faculty member, uh, when I had three kids and girls would come into my office and say, you know, I, I want to be just like you. you. You're kind of a normal person and you have a family and you have a great career. And I used to sit there thinking, gosh, I'm such a fraud. I'm, <laughs> I am holding on by my fingertips. And um, if they knew how difficult it was. Um, so I do think as a society, we need to do far more to make it easier for women early in their careers to combine having a family and a career. Thank you for that. those really astute words, because uh, I think that's absolutely right. The, the toxicity in all of our workplaces that don't support family life, um, both for men and for women, um, is I think it's damaging to the soul. And I think also as a rabbi um, who has to care for a whole community every single day, um, I know the times I was pulled away from my family. I, have a, I also have a son, um, not, not sick. Uh, one was enough, hard enough, <laughs> um, for me, um, and also to care for all these other people. And, um, and so it was sometimes hanging on by a thread to be able to balance work, to be able to balance the lives of my congregants. Um, but also then when you're sitting at tables where sometimes you're the only woman, uh, simply to be heard sometimes. I think is, is often difficult. And so to be able to learn how to communicate when you are the only woman sitting at a table full of men, uh, of powerful men, um, and to make the transformations that one needs to and continue to pave the way for other women to follow behind and not just have them write you off. Oh, well, that's just her. But to be able to create a pathway for dialogue, um, a pathway for maybe bringing a little different kind of thinking to the entire enterprise, whatever the enterprise is, um, is a burden that I think rests upon those of us that are first in our fields uh, wherever we go. I know as a rabbi, uh, there aren't, weren't a lot of role models for me. As, a, as the professor said, I was the first woman in the city of Los Angeles to have her own pulpit. There were other women rabbis, but they worked in the college campus, and they worked in day school, in, in, in day schools, they were assistant rabbis, they weren't the head of their own community. And so that put me in conversations with other rabbis in town that were also the head of their congregations. And um, some, I wasn't taken seriously when I was 28 years old. I was 28 years old when I started. And um, I then started my own congregation from scratch, entrepreneurial rabbis, right? We're going to be talking about entrepreneurism here at BGU, right? So, so um, and I was 32. And so we did a startup. And, you know, I was called by other rabbis in, in Los Angeles, the lesbian pig rabbi, in the Jewish papers. And they printed it. So when you, when you have that kind of, 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 of blockage, so that you have to take that deep breath and you have to also understand a great sense of what's just and what's right and believe in that justice and in that righteousness. And in my community, when we started it, people were dying of AIDS. And so my job, I knew always was very clear when I, as I was ministering them to, to treat everyone as a human being with dignity and self-worth and to overcome the general public ideas that gay people were somehow uh, criminals or that gay people weren't worthy of being treated as human beings. And this is the message of Judaism that I have tried to teach and also in the larger world. And that sense of knowing what is the right message and to be sure of that and to be confident as, as, as a, if you're the only person saying the message at the table. Uh, for your community, um, you have to be able to say it with forthrightness and uh, with a sense of compassion. Um, it's not always easy for others to hear that message, um, but you have to stay on message uh, to be able to share it uh, time and again. Uh, to be
queer women from disadvantaged minority group and in, in leading position make my responsibilities, makes my responsibilities so complicated. I am so sensitive to diversity. Most of the time I feel, uh, I feel a strong feeling of obligation to help students, to help faculty member, young faculty member, particularly women from different minority, gr minority groups. And as a result of this strong feeling of obligation, in, 90, in 2090, me and two uh, colleagues, uh, Dr. Uh, Tila Kalaji, uh, a faculty member of B BGU uh, from the ultra-Orthodox uh, minority, and Efrat Yardai, a, a doctoral student from uh, the Ethiopian minority, the three of us spent two years developing a guide to promote a cultural competence in, uh, uh, among uh, uh, acad acad academic staff. This guide uh, uh, aim aims to help uh, faculty members and administration staff to be aware to cultural and ethnic differences and to have the right tools to work with them uh, uh, effectively. Um, I, I want to add to that, that I find myself uh, in so many committees and initiatives in the academia and outside the academia. For example, educational committees, health committees, and so many others. Uh, and all of that for the goal for making a change in the lives of people from my society and from other minorities. Um, working in the high-tech domain, um, I find myself many times, and specifically I worked on the cyber technology, cyber, cyber security um, domain, I found myself uh, within my roles in the academia and uh, my roles in industries, sometimes uh, the one woman in a, in a room of pool with men, sometimes they thought that I'm the secretary and ask me for coffee, but you know, um, um, because of that, um, it makes you, um, they expect you, you know, you have to make them trust you. I mean, you have to excel so that to gain uh, other people's trust. Um, and I, you know, um, if a woman is a leader or if a woman is a manager, uh, the same behavior as men, I found it that sometimes is uh, uh, perceptive differently. For example, if, uh, if a, a man would have some, you know, this hard decision, then people would say that he's very decisive, very um, decisive in, in, in um, has like a, a large thinking, but the woman would be considered like a bitch sometime. So like, um, I, I would say that um, you have to really uh, find your way to gain trust and to really fit in. But um, this, uh, what I say, burden, uh, actually made me uh, really want to change it and I, I and things are changing in industry and in the academia and I really uh, am involved in um, many activities for that I try to um, really uh, talk to uh, to to students to high school kids I really try to uh, be involved in uh, different activities um, I just wanted to tell you, when I graduated my uh, a bachelor degree, I went to my first uh, a job interview, and it was, you know, uh, this age's political correctness was not really an issue. So he just told me, I can't hire you. You're like a religious woman. You're going to have like a kid every year. What am I going to do? So I said, okay. I would, uh, today, people may think it, but would not say it, maybe. So I really uh, thought um, it's an opportunity. I don't think, see it as a burden, but as an opportunity. And I see the change over the years, and I think there's still a lot to do, and I really want to have it uh, changed. So I think one thing that um, came up uh, in quite few of your comments is um, the, 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 the balance between 
I will say, between family and career. And I want to ask you, how can we make um, the, not, not just how you balance it, but how can we make the space, whether it's academia, or whether it's other social spaces, more accommodating uh, for family life? And I think, I would say on a personal note, I think it's also important for men, not just for women. Uh, Um, well, I think there's a, a lot we have to do. Part of the problem, of course, is the critical period in establishing your career is, tends to be in your 30s or 20s, 30s, which is exactly the time when y you have children. So, uh, and most professions don't accommodate that. Um, having been in both the US and the UK, I think the UK system, and I, forgive me, but I don't know the Israeli academic system well enough to know, but in the UK, in the US, it's an upper out system. So it is really inhospitable to having uh, children. Um, whereas in, in the UK, you can take longer to get promotion. So you can take a, a slower pace if you want. The difficulty if you do that, of course, is that you get pegged as not, a, not being a, a high flyer. And of course, having children is the ultimate public good, but we persist in dealing with it as treating it as if it were a private um, decision. And so I, I remember going to the first, my first um, faculty meeting at Harvard and um, uh, hearing a, a speech from the dean about various things which had no relevance to me. And I said to him, look, the one thing that um, I find I'm operating with my hand tied around by my back is that I have a, a young child and I can't even get them into the daycare center. And he said, nobody asked you to have a child, that's your decision. So that, that was the, I think we, we have changed since then. Yeah. And I don't think that kind of response would be acceptable today. Uh, I was the only one who took umbrage at it at the time. Um, so I think we just have to adapt career paths to accommodate for the fact that men and women, as you rightly say, fathers you know, are entitled to this extraordinary period of enjoying the, the young years of their children. I, I think we just have to accommodate uh, careers. And of course, we're all living longer, we're all working long, longer just have um, a, a different sense of a career trajectory. And that's certainly, when I talk to young people, I always say, think about the entire duration of your career. And that will put those few years, very difficult years, in a, a broader context. Yeah. I, I think this, the systemic changes and, uh, that have to be made are, are really critical. Um, providing those opportunities to have flexible work time and flexible career time, especially when the children are small, right? To, just to get them till you get them to bed, sometimes you need your own breath to take your time for yourself to breathe. Um, but to allow that opportunity um, in the workspace to sometimes bring your children with you, to sometimes be able to um, to have the providing of childcare in the States, uh, often childcare is not provided. And so it becomes an, another essential burden uh, in the workspace. And um, I have to say that was one of the benefits of creating my own synagogue is I could set my own rules. I, to be honest with you, and I didn't have to set in, fit into a system that somebody else created, but we created our own culture as a result of that. Um, and I had the flexibility in the afternoon when my son was playing a baseball to go and help coach and to help be there with him. I, I might have had to go back to the synagogue later in the evening uh, for meetings, but at least at the times that he needed me uh, as a young young boy, I was able to be there. And, and I think that's something that we have to think about more in all of our work places and all of the ways in which we work. Uh, I want to reflect, to answer this question, I want to reflect on two elements that I use in my, in my uh, uh, career and the, how I navigate uh, between family and, uh, and work. And from that to go and to suggest a, a, a workshop for uh, for uh, to be conducted uh, in the academia, uh, in the university. Uh, first, if, if I think about the most important two things that I, I, I did through, through my career, first of all, to use all the help that I get from my family, from my husband, from my mother, from my mother-in-law, to use all the help in, 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 uh, in helping me taking care of my children, my six children. Um, uh, uh, then when my children grew up, 
uh, uh, they themselves uh, were a great help. The other thing is related to developing the skill to uh, uh, distinguishing and defining between the most important thing at work and family and focusing on them and to let go all the other things that are less important. Based on these two aspects, I want to suggest, and it's close to my field, psychology and uh, counseling, I want to suggest to conduct on a regular basis a workshops for women and for men to, take about, to talk about their parenting, about their challenging, to share, to, to hear about the other skills uh, used by other faculty members. I think this workshop... Sarah, uh, it's sold. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> I see Danny and uh, Aleli. Yeah, I am in. <laughs> so I think a, a such workshop will help to do all the process by high level of awareness and to have the tools to navigate successfully between work and family. I can agree more with uh, Sarah. I, um, I think the same. I have to set your priorities and understand what is important and what is not. And it's very important to have a supportive uh, spouse at least. If not, uh, if you could afford also a supportive family, that's uh, great. Um, and uh, that, that's from a personal level. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> but... Um, but from the system point of view, I think um, is the academic world has to see the main challenges and try to um, bring solution. It, it's happening, but it has to happen more. I think one very, very uh, big challenge is a postdoc. Um, usually it happens when you have, <coughs> sorry, little kids. Uh, and you have to go uh, abroad if you want to be, um, if, if you want to be like good research. Um, I don't think a, a solution that uh, tells you you can stay in, in, in your country and do your postdoc, <clears throat> it's not a good solution because you're going to be um, lowering your achievements later. It just, it's not a good solution. So there's, there should be like a lot of support for going to postdoc. Um, I could, I remember myself, I had uh, five little children when I had to go to the postdoc. My oldest was 10 years and my youngest was six months. And just because my husband was on a mission to the U.S. from the Israeli army, I could do it. Otherwise, I don't know um, how I could do it, but, but I mean, it shouldn't be a matter of luck. It should be something that has to be thought of. Um, there should be like a support for women or men that go on postdoc because this is very critical for the, academic, uh, for the next academic career. So, thank you, Waha. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I think we need, um, we need also not, not just to rely on you know, people managing their time or women managing their time, but also structural um, uh, solutions and supporting uh, women postdoc is one of them. We do that uh, at BGU, but we probably should do it on a larger scale than we are able now. Um, and, and another thing that I mean I found in my position is quite challenging in the last year is dealing with COVID or I don't know if I can say post-COVID <laughs> era, but the, the fact uh, COVID had on family lives and, and especially young parents and young mother, let's say, was quite, uh, quite a challenge both for PhD students and for faculty before tenure. And we did take some measurements to try and, and support um, those who got mostly affected by, by COVID. So yeah, I think it's a good point. And I, I, I'm just gonna, I'm now gonna turn into kind of the personal, more kind of tailor hand questions. And I'm actually gonna um, turn the order and I'll start with you. And uh, I'm, what, what I want to ask you is, I mean, you've been quite involved, and you mentioned it, uh, with uh, promoting women in STEM, uh, both in, at BGU, but also uh, as part of your role, the Ministry of uh, Science and Technology. And I want to ask you, I mean, what 
can be done to raise the numbers of women that take STEM professions, uh, STEM degrees, and what do you do also in your capacity? Okay, I think um, uh, it should start from childhood. Um, there should be like, uh, all kind, and there are all kind of programs to encourage uh, girls to take um, uh, more math and then in high school because um, I could tell you from my personal experience it's hard to um, complete what you missed uh, during high school um, and also like to create the atmosphere of more girls um, uh, uh, being there because I talked to many um, girl students and they said that they are, if they participate in the, all, all those like um, programs for excellent students sometimes they're like um, very um, like very few girls within a lot of uh, kids, you know, in the age of um, uh, 15 or 16, that matters a lot. It's, it's, um, it, it produces a lot of uh, challenges to the girls, so we have to have more and to make sure that more girls are involved during their childhood and high school. And then, of course, um, uh, for the university, uh, what's already being done, but maybe in, in a larger scale, uh, encourage students, um, encourage departments, encourage um, a female student to take this, um, a, a, these professions, maybe also showing them role models, um, explaining them. Um, bringing like uh, people from industry, women, very good women from industry that are leading companies and just show them that uh, it's impossible. Um, yeah, at, um, at my uh, role at the uh, Ministry of uh, Council, we really uh, think of this as like a, an education committee and we are in the academia committee and we really um, uh, propose all kind of idea of how to actually encourage uh, um, uh, more female uh, students to go into this uh, because it's really, really important. Yeah. So, uh, Sarah, to you. And um, I think one of the, uh, I'm a bit familiar with your work, so one of the unique characteristics of your work is, is trying to be, always be relevant to the communities you're researching, especially to the Bedouin uh, Arabs community in, in, in the South, but um, to be relevant to the field, to, to make change in society. And I wonder if you can uh, uh, talk a little bit about what sort of philosophy, research philosophy stands behind it and give us some examples of your work. Sure. Um, uh, in to answer this, this question, I want to take you back to my early stage uh, of career, especially my PhD studies. During my PhD studies, I struggled uh, and I have a lot of difficulties because the lack and the limited uh, of knowledge and uh, empirical research about the Bedouin society. At that time, I make two promises to myself. First, that my, my, uh, purpose, my uh, goal is to build a body of knowledge and a body of empirical research about mental health among Bedouin society. The second promise was to take this, this knowledge and to simplify it and to make it accessible in the community level uh, uh, among service providers and mental health professionals. I do that in a variety of, of a, a research uh, topic. For example, I have some work on a mental health, common mental health in the community level, uh, depression, anxiety, and, and somatic complaints. The knowledge that I, I collected in my research and the main findings, I give a public uh, lectures and lectures for the professional, uh, mental health professionals to keep them updated but about which psychological distress the Bedouin uh, uh, individual from the Bedouin uh, 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 Arab society suffer. Uh, other example is about positive outcomes uh, related to mental health. We have a research projects related to integration process in higher education and in job market. 
we have a conference that included many uh, 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 important uh, parties working around the employment issues and education issues to bring this, what we have found in our research, to know the difficulties, the resources that may help this, uh, uh, in this case, uh, uh, educated, college educated women, and how we can facilitate the integration process of uh, different subgroups in the Bedouin Arab community. Um, this to you. Um, one, when we had a preliminary uh, talk before this panel, one of the things that resonated with me that you said is that you defined yourself as transformational leader and that you strive to promote uh, queer Jewish experience. And I wonder if you can elaborate a bit more. Well, I think it goes back, uh, Professor, when we were talking all together about being a first because uh, there is, as Louise said, a very important respons uh, responsibility, burden, you can call it either way, um, uh, because of thinking about the women that will come after you. And, I, as, and, and like you, Sarah, it's, you have multiple identities, right? So we th I think about it not only as a woman leader, but also as a, as a, a LGBTQ plus person who is uh, out in front. And so um, when I talk about transformation, I wanna be able to not just say it only was with me, me, that there was something unique that I did, but to be able to blaze a trail in some ways for others who to rise up. Um, and it, it's always heartening for me to see young leaders, uh, women, uh, gay people, um, to be able to come and bring their truths, to bring their talents and to bring their skills um, to whatever the situation, whether it's in the synagogue world like I do or in the academic world, um, be, and to say there's a place at the table and for me, that's part of what being a transformational leader is, is to not just accept the systems that are in place, but to see how we can broaden them and to bring more people in to share their talents and their gifts um, with everyone else. So I think uh, uh, it's actually, uh, I'm really happy you said that because it's sort of falling into the question that I want to ask you. Um, how do we, make sure that there are going to be more women in leadership position or in other words how can we make sure that the short list is <laughs> full of uh, excellent women thank you well I, I think in a sense we've we've addressed this earlier I think um, my own view is the reason almost all careers uh, are shaped like a pyramid is because of this critical period of um, when women are having children and have to get their career off the ground. That to me is the biggest impediment. So that's one reason we have to be able to um, address that, provide childcare, change expectations around parental responsibilities, change our vision of what uh, a career path is to accommodate having children. I think we need to support women who do make it to the top to ensure that they're successful. Uh, and I think those of us who are in these enormously privileged positions make sure that we see it as part of our responsibility to help, as everybody on this panel clearly does, to help the women who come after us. It hasn't always been the case. Um, and I think we should be totally upfront about this. When I was interviewed for the job at St. Andrews, um, it hadn't escaped my notice that there wasn't a single woman in the senior uh, leadership of the university. And I was very open with them and said, look, if you appoint me, I will not preside over a senior management team that looks like this. Um, um, and I think, you know, there was pa panic, I was told, that they thought, you know, I was going to appoint every skirt that <laughs> passed by. And, and, um, and instead, you know, it took me a little time. Uh, by the time I left, we were 50-50 male, female, but every, one, every single one of those women were appointed on their merits. It was transparently obvious to everyone that they were. So I think initially, some of the women were annoyed at me for not moving more quickly. Um, so I think we just have to work harder at identifying the very smart and able women out there and make sure that we don't buy into um, yeah, this concept one always hears, uh, I'd love to ban this word, uh, fit, about fit for a role. Uh, so often, this is what we hear, everybody's qualified for the role, but they're not a good fit. But what does a fit mean? It's very subjunctive, and it's too easy for it to be gendered. I think most of the 
jobs I applied for, I, I heard subsequently, they were worried I wouldn't be tough enough. Because somehow, if you're a, a, a normal woman, you're not tough. And so it's this completely um, fraudulent notion of what toughness is. Uh, and it, it's tough connotes male, martial, and all the rest of it. Um, whereas, in fact, I think I'm tougher than most men I know. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, one of the, the challenges uh, many women in leadership position find themselves is exactly that. I mean, on the one hand, not being perceived tough enough, but on the other hand, uh, using, uh, quoting Bracha, being perceived as a bitch. Sorry about the uh, language. But, uh, and this is, uh, I think, sort of uh, one of the challenges that uh, women in uh, leadership position has, uh, have to deal with. So um, on that note, and uh, I would like to thank you and for an inspiring conversation and for being an inspiration and each one of you in your own merit. Um, and uh, thank you very much. A, a, a quick impromptu. I think what we've seen here, that this is completely unplanned and a microphone unplanned is a dangerous thing. But what we've seen, I'm, I'm, just, I'm incredibly humbled right now. What we have seen here is the epitome of the values that we strive for as Ben Gurion University. We talked about equity and inclusion. We talked about integrity. We talked about excellence. We talked about being bold. We talked about together. Everything. And it wasn't planned that way. This is what we hold up in front of us as what we strive to get at. We are not there. But I thank you, Haleli, for leading the way in the university. I thank you for taking part in this. And one more round of applause. This was just fabulous. Uh, we, we, uh, first, Danny wants to, uh, I'll bring to come in for a photo. So please, uh, Sarah Lionel, if you can. And we have another part of the awards uh, uh, part of the session, so don't go quite yet. What do we have? They, they, the Akron Awards. Oh, I forgot about that. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah no yeah. worries. You have to do one photo with the panel. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I think so. Yes. Don't move. <laughs> it is the help room. Yeah. <laughs> we should have them. But if you, if you can actually get them. Yeah. Yeah. Here we go. I'm a furniture mover by profession. Okay, so uh, as I said, don't go quite yet. So the second part of this session is, uh, um, is the, the annual Halpern Lecture on the winner of the Michel Halpern Memorial Research Prize. Uh, and this year Memorial Research Prize will be granted uh, to uh, two uh, of my uh, colleagues and dear friends, one of them uh, will give the lecture, uh, Professor Ephraim Shoram Steiner and Professor Guy Ben Porat. And I would just say that um, next year I hope to see also women among the recipients. I uh, had to say that, otherwise I wouldn't do my role. Um, so I'm just going to... Danny. <laughs> I'm just going to say a few words uh, about uh, uh, Professor Shoam Steiner, who's not with us today, he's on sabbatical. He's a world-known uh, researcher of Jewish history. His international acclaimed book, Jews and Crimes in Medieval Europe, focused on judicial, social, and religious approaches to the crime of, uh, in Jewish society and medieval Europe, and investigates how Jewish judicial and leadership figures in medieval Europe dealt with crime. And the other recipient is Professor Guy ben Porat, uh, whose research focused on police and minority groups in Israel and globally. 
Due to the growing public importance and interest in this field in recent years, Ben Porat frequently appears in media workshop and high impact uh, public forums. He, has, he was the academic advisor of the Ab Abraham Initiatives project, Arab Society and Police, designed to build trust and cultivate collaboration between the, the police and the minority groups. And he was also a member of the public committee created to investigate uh, racism against people of Ethiopian origins in Israel. So, Guy, I can't see you. Oh, Guy. So, the floor is yours. Thank you. So thank you, thank you for being here. Um, it's nice to receive prizes. Um, it's especially nice at your own institution, among your own community. So this is highly, highly appreciated. So I want to thank the Halpern family for uh, this prize. And I want to thank uh, everyone else involved in that. And I have about 10 minutes to give a lecture on the reason for this prize, which is usually warm up for uh, academics. I'll try and do my best in 10 minutes and try to explain why policing, one of the most important topics of research to be in, the, in this century, actually. So, uh, what makes a person study policing? Nothing of experience, never encountered police, clean slate record, I promise you. However, accidentally, I stumbled on this issue when I visited in Canada about 12 years ago, where I said, Something here is interesting. We don't research police that much. It does have an impact on our life. Then I went back to what every political science student will study in his first year on how do we define a state. And Max Weber, one of the greatest sociologists, tells us it's about the monopoly of the use of force. Use of force is police. So policing is an essential topic. I think in recent years it's become obvious how important policing is to our life. And we can think of the US, where we saw these incredible and frightening scenes of clashes, but also in France, in the UK. I could go on and on and on. Um, but I think there's something more about policing. I think policing is about citizenship. It's about our standing in the community as groups and individuals. And we ask ourselves simple questions. Are we safe? And if not, why not? Are we treated with respect? Fairly? And if not, why not? And how are we compared to other citizens? This is a very important comparison. So police is very important. It's about a symbolic thing. The way I'm treated tells me something about how I am as a citizen. Am I equal? Do I deserve respect? It's also a practical thing. Can I walk the streets safely without being stopped, harassed by police or by criminals? And as we more and more approach the idea of a shared society, where different groups have to live together and coexist, policing is and will be a central institution to be studied and hopefully to be reformed at some time soon. So then the question is, why do people don't trust police? What makes groups distrust police? There can be three reasons. One is moral alignment or the lack of moral alignment. So groups think the police and them do not share the same values. What police enforces here is something that's against my beliefs or my way of life. The second thing is about over-policing. Police tends to racial profile me because of my skin color. I am more exposed to violence. I'm harassed by police. Why would I trust them? And under policing, I'm neglected. Police doesn't care about me. My neighborhood is not safe. And the other one is safe. 
Again, all these things tell us something about our standing, about citizenship. Um, why is trust so important? Or what is trust? So we trust someone because we believe he's doing his job the right way. The way we expect him to do his job. To protect me. To respect me. And it's important because police, like many other institutions, require trust. Our students require, we require to them to trust us, even more so with police. And we can get people to comply in two ways. One is instrumentally. We can make them fear us. We can use force. That will get compliance. However, it's very costly, not efficient, and may I say, unfair. Or we can get them to normatively agree, to believe that we, as public servants, are doing the right thing, that we have them in mind, that we listen to them. Okay, that's how you want to get trust. And having doing this work for more than a decade, I've been studying Ethiopian young people, people of Ethiopian descent, I should say, who feel police is over-policing them. They're harassed, they're being stopped, they're being abused. Skin color plays a role here. We have Arab citizens who feel neglected, who feel that their communities are, communities are not safe. Homicide rates are over the roof. And from their perception, police does not do enough to prevent that. Ultra-Orthodox who clash with police over issues of different values, but I think police is too aggressive and fails to listen to what they have to say. So how do you study police? So my approach has been from the bottom up. Beginning by listening to citizens and trying to identify the problem. Not trivial. Policymakers often have the solutions, then they look for the problem. So this is kind of, well, let's work the other way around. Let's try and see what the problem is. And what can we learn when we talk to people, when we try to find the right questions? Put a theory around it. We can learn about how they perceive police. What is police for them? A threat or something you can turn to? What are they concerned of? What do they fear? What do they demand? What is what they need as citizens? And how does all that relate to their perception of citizenship? What does it mean to be a citizen when you're neglected, when you're abused? What does that tell you about how you stand in your country. And what have I learned so far? So, we say minorities. That's a general term. There are different minorities, different concerns, different ideas, different values. We talk about police and citizens, this can be asked about gender, about class, about ethnicity, about nationality. All these things can have a relevance to the way people feel. I would say that being visible is important. Skin color matters. You can be over-policed simply for having a black skin. Vulnerability is important because if you are weak, then you are more likely to be mistreated. So the combination of the two is actually deadly. There's perceptions and reality. People believe police is X, but is it, is it, is it really so? Well, most times actually they do have a point when they fear or distrust police. But even if they are wrong, even if these perceptions are not entirely right, the encounter between them and the police officer will bear the burden of these perceptions. So perceptions can't be ignored. Policing is essential for all groups think, yes, we need police. We can't do without police. 
We have things that need to be taken care of by police. But police must be reformed. And when you think of police reform here in the US, anywhere, it's again about the concept of citizenship, about how police is something that gives citizens the feeling of belonging, of safety, and of respect. These are all non-trivial questions when you think of the other tasks police has to fulfill. That also must be acknowledged. Um, how do we do this? How do we approach these questions? Well, again, I think when we start from the bottom up, we learn about how people live their lives, how they perceive their safety, their belonging, and their citizenship. And then we can try and think of how do we make those changes. So there's a bigger story here about citizenship, of a shared society. And one day, and I'm, Sarah gave me here a, a pitch, when we have a center here for a study of shared society, policing would be a central element of that study. Thank you very much. Well, uh, first, congratulations for the prize, and thank you very much. It was fascinating, and I think we can. Uh, um, there are common themes, in a sense, of how you feel as a citizen, both in the country, but also in your institution, and whether you feel you, you own that right or you're a stranger to it. So, thank you very much, and we'll uh, hold on. I think uh, photographs. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I've certainly, I don't know about you, I've certainly learned a lot this morning. And thank you, Haleli, for, and the panel for inspiring us. And Guy, Guy, self, Guy, thank you. And uh, Professor Effie ben Shawn will be here with us next year to share with us uh, um, the findings as well. Um, we have uh, one more formal session to go before, uh, before relaxing in the pool or the spa, and then that incredible dedication uh, later on this afternoon. Um, so our students who have been with us, we have a special lunch for you outside in the Paula uh, uh, Garden, and then the rest of you have lunch here or elsewhere. But I urge you all to be back here at uh, 1 p.m. where um, um, we're going to be meeting uh, David Grossman. Uh, Israel, who you received an on-doc last night, and uh, Israel's prize winner. I may get into trouble for saying this, but uh, as Booker Prize recipient, the, he's probably likely to be the next Israeli to receive the Nobel, Nobel Prize for Literature since Shai Agnon in the 60s. I think if it doesn't happen, it might be politics getting in the way, but uh, you want to be able to be here to, when that does happen, or when he do, it doesn't happen to say, I was there, when he was at P BGU. So please, please be back here. Don't miss it with, uh, for David Grossman at one o'clock. And then after that, we'll go and let you relax and uh, get ready for this evening. So thank you very much. And thank you for the panel. Thank you very much.